Every month, usually on the fourth Friday of the month, he joins us to talk a little bit about law enforcement and law enforcement related topics. And we are very pleased that he is able to join us this morning. Um, rescheduling and we've got everything in order here. Steve Kepker is the sheriff of Ottawa County. He joins us via the Zoom connection from the Sheriff's Department headquarters in the Fillmore Street Complex in West Olive. Steve, good morning and welcome back to Talk at the Town. Good morning, Gary. Uh, great to be back again with you. Glad you are with us. And um, no, I, I'm not going to say anything. Uh, by the way, we, you know, and the Zoom connection, Steve's got the suit and tie on. But as we've known in this uh, 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 Zoom era, now, yeah, suit and tie on top, and you're you know, wearing your fuzzies on the bottom. But I don't think you're <laughs> that way, Steve. No, it's uh, the dress pants are here, Gary. And as you can see in the background, uh, I am in my office up at the Fillmore Complex. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I've seen some of those videos where uh, people have uh, stood at, like, county board meetings and have stood up to do the Pledge of Allegiance. And it's the uh, dress shirt and tie, and then they're, uh, they're flowered uh, shorts, you know? <laughs> Yeah, put on the fuzzies or the or the or the or the, or the, the warmies. Anyway, uh, we have some serious things we want to talk to you about. A couple of things I want to touch base with you on very quickly. Um, it was I don't think it was last Saturday or was it last Saturday that drug take back uh, situation? And I think that's two or three yeah. times that's going on. Yes, uh, this we had year, the, this well, year. we had we had the one specific event last week uh, in. Uh, cohorts with uh, Spectrum Health and uh, our county mental health department. Extremely successful. Again, uh, it was a drive-through event uh, because of the COVID. Uh, so I've got some numbers here. Uh, it, again, uh, we partnered up there with uh, county mental health and Spectrum Hospital of Zealand. It was held uh, at their facility there in Zealand. And uh, the medications, they took in 406 pounds of uh, medications and 120 pounds of what they call sharps, uh, used needles or needles that people had. Uh, sometimes when a loved one passes away, there's you know needles left over for if they have diabetic situations or whatever. Uh, so they also took those in, uh, which is, is great. So then uh, this came from 175 people. So 58% um, of the people disposed of controlled medications such as opioids, stimulants, or other sedatives. Uh, and again, it, it's important that we do get those off the street. And uh, they also at this uh, offered the Narcan kits. Uh, I think many people may be aware that Narcan is a, uh, a tool now available. Uh, it's like a medication uh, to reverse the effects of an overdose. Uh, Narcan has saved uh, countless lives just here in our county, uh, whether it's been administered by uh, EMS, fire, or law enforcement. All law enforcement officers uh, in Ottawa County now carry Narcan with them. So again, it, it was great uh, to get uh, you know a successful take back uh, in the partnership with uh, Spectrum Health and our uh, our county mental health, and I'm sure that there will be more coming. Uh, it was kind of good news yesterday that hopefully we can get some of our events back in and and starting to flow again this summer and kind of get back to a norm as uh, you know some of the restrictions appear that uh, as things get better will obviously uh, be be lifted. 395-1450-616-395-1450. Peg McNichol has a question from the newsroom. Go ahead, Peg. Hi, Sheriff Kemker. I Hi, emailed, hi, I can't see you, but, and neither can you see me, but here we are. Um, I had emailed you, Sheriff Baker, and uh, officials over at Holland PD to ask about this. I don't know how many people heard about this Killology seminar on the other side of the state. And you all responded in saying that your officers do not attend that training. And I will have a story on this later, but if you can just talk about the type of training you are able to do during COVID to keep your officers up to date, because I know life changes so fast and there's always ways to update best practices. Uh, and before you answer that, Steve, um, she's referring to um, police training uh, so, because we've talked about it, but our listeners have not I, talked about it. Right. Our listeners, I don't know how it's been in the news, but not on our website yet. And this is a seminar where the, the, this is a former military guy who has trained officers for decades, both military and police. And I, I understand his training involves if, an, if there's an officer involved shooting, how to help people mentally 
recoup from that and and understand the range of emotions they go through. And he started out training soldiers who had gone to war. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get uh, Sheriff Kempker's response. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, Peggy and Gary, and I, I think that's uh, Colonel Grossman uh, that has been doing these for a long time. I, to be honest with you, Peggy, have uh, never attended any of his seminars. Uh, I haven't even looked at his uh, website. Uh, I do know that some of it deals with that mindset, like you said, of how to deal with a traumatic situation like an officer-involved shooting, um, you know, much like uh, what a psychologist would do. Um, and I know Colonel Grossman, just uh, from the information I've heard from other staff, you know, uh, he did train military people uh, in how to deal with that after combat situations and that. So obviously mental health is a, is a huge uh, component uh, for our people for their health and their safety. And uh, so there are other programs out there. You know, we use, uh, we use a, a local vendor, uh, I guess to put it that way, um, to help us in situations. Uh, we have peer support. Uh, but again, if an officer is involved in a traumatic situation, and, and we've taken it a step further, Peg and Gary, um, you know, we've had some tragic accidents recently involving very young people that have passed away, uh, or we have other situations you know, we, we've always in the past with our victim services, we have surrounded the family in that, but we have also found we need to surround our officers that have to deal with this tragedy uh, that, you know, at the end of that shift have to go home to their families. Um, so we have peer support, but we also have a specialist that comes in now, um, you know, and, and I'll name the company, it's Pine Rest out of uh, Grand Rapids. They do a fantastic job of coming in and basically doing a debriefing, walking through the whole incident, uh, and explain to people why they have these emotions and why they have these feelings. And I think I've said this before in the air with you, uh, both of you know that for a long time, I did fatal accident investigations. Uh, I handled uh, almost over 400 of them. I can tell both of you that only once that I can remember, somebody asked me if I was doing okay. Because you have to remember, I, I was the, the primary response. We've, we've changed this now a little bit. So it's a, a team aspect. But I was called out all hours of the day, seven days a week, holidays, um, and would go out to these scenes. I would deal with the scene itself. Uh, you would deal with the tragedy at the scene. You would deal with the families. Um, and you would deal with uh, things way after these accidents. You know, I still have people today uh, that will call me, uh, sometimes on the anniversary of the crash, and just say, can you walk me through a few things again? And I get the report file out. Um, you know, and, and I've, I've actually become friends with some people in this community through these tragedies. So the training aspect for us, uh, Peg, in these situations, uh, it was a little difficult uh, during COVID. Uh, we're starting to see, I guess, to put it, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we're starting to do some uh, of our training back in person again, uh, very small in size, you know, keeping everybody spaced apart. They each have their own table. Uh, it's difficult to train online. Um, you know, we just did a complete overhaul of our policy and procedures and the component of that policy and procedure overhaul was a built in training component. So when they, they put out a new policy and procedure that the, the uh, staff has to read that, uh, understand it. And then they take a small training quiz at the end of that. But also this company has built in training videos on different topics. Some of our seminars have been done virtual. And I will tell you, because I've been in a couple of these seminars, it is hard to sit in front of your computer screen in your office uh, and watch somebody talk to you for six hours. And, you know, you take your break and you're alone. You don't have that uh, camaraderie ship or that uh, partnership building with other people. And I think as Gary and Peg, you probably have seen as you're talking to people, you see, you know, they're down on the keyboard doing stuff or writing notes. Uh, or the screen goes blank. You know, some of the trainings now they say your screen has to stay on so they know you're in the room and paying attention. So, um, <laughs> it's been a challenge, but we've kept up on our training. Uh, a lot of our, uh, you know, obviously with uh, firearms and other stuff that they have to do, uh, we are doing those in person. But, you know, uh, firearms training sometimes is just one on one right now. Uh, and, that, and that's a huge deal for us when we have about 175 people to train with, uh, you know, with our firearms. We have our state mandated training that did not go away. We still follow through on that. But we are looking forward to getting, you know, back into the reality of the real world training 
Um, and again, we do a lot of training. And as I said before, you know, after the George Floyd incident, uh, we were already doing a lot of training and we'll be doing more training. Uh, you know, we do a lot. We're working now on some de-escalation uh, training. Uh, and, uh, you know, our, our, our staff is well trained and that's something that we have to maintain. Let, let me get to a call. Hopefully he's still with us. Good morning. You're on the line with Steve Kempker, the Ottawa County Sheriff. Yes, this is going to be kind of a long question. But That's okay. in San Francisco, we hear that people walk into retail stores and just take what they want because the police can't control it. And so with all the defunding the police, do you see a day when the police locally will be defunded and dismantled and federal policing will start to happen, even in a place like Holland? Yeah, that's good. That's a tough question. Appreciate yeah. the call, and you can listen off the air for the response. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, that is a, a tough one, Gary, because uh, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, we have the West Michigan attitude here. Um, this is an absolutely great community to be the sheriff of. Uh, and I know the chiefs of police in this community uh, absolutely love their communities. Um, we have good support uh, from both our citizens. Uh, and obviously, Gary, there are times people don't like law enforcement. Um, you know, we've always said, you know, okay, if we took our road patrol off the road for two days, uh, I could about imagine what it would be like. Uh, the crime is not going away. As a matter of fact, we're seeing an increase in our crimes. We're seeing an increase in violent crimes. We're seeing an increase in weapon violations. Um, I don't see that coming here. Uh, you know, there has not been any talk of defunding. Uh, we run a, a very well uh, organized department here. Uh, we always come in under budget. Um, and we stay and spend our money wisely. And uh, like I said, a lot of that now is going into the, the training. Uh, the hiring is key to hiring good quality professional people and, uh, you know, to provide that service to our community. Um, you know, and I, you hear of the you know, defunding and, you know, when I listen to seminars and do some of the reading that I, I see in some of the magazines that, that we get, the police magazines and that, some of the defunding isn't actually defunding. It's just, okay, we'll dissolve this unit, but we're going to move that money elsewhere in the department. Um, you know, and, and the big keyword has been community policing. Uh, you know, and I hear agencies, not here in Michigan, but outside of Michigan saying, well, we're going to start community policing. Well, we started community policing here in Ottawa County 30 years ago. And that's been the backbone of our agency and the success of our agency uh, is working with our community. Um, you know, I don't have a problem if an officer stops his car and gets out and talks with somebody. Um, but no, I think, you know, if there's a victim of crime, uh, under law, uh, they have rights and it is our duty and our obligation, uh, to investigate crime and take what actions necessary, uh, to provide that service to the victims of crime in our county. A uh, topic that has been broached before on these airwaves, Steve, is dealing with, uh, body cams for sheriff's deputies and their superiors. Where are we standing on that? Well, Gary, I'm uh, probably pleased to announce that we are moving forward. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I, I did take finally a, a couple days off for some vacation and uh, came back to the news that uh, you know my request uh, to move forward uh, with this project uh, is okayed. And so we'll be moving forward. Uh, we're forming our uh, committee group right now. Uh, obviously, we have to look at uh, the vendors. Uh, we have to look at, uh, like I said, there's a lot of things on the backside of a body camera project uh, and the in-car cameras. Uh, and the biggest part of that is the IT, the technical side of it. You know, where do we store all this massive data? Uh, it is also going to require that uh, we hire probably one to two people to manage a system of this size for an agency of our size. You know, we're not a small agency anymore. Um, there's the FOIA requests that come in. Uh, obviously, there has to be redaction done on the videos uh, with certain things uh, required by law. So it, uh, it's not going to be a, a small task. Uh, it's not something that's going to be here overnight, but I would hope by uh, maybe late fall uh, that we are in a position to uh, flip the switch to on and uh, move forward. And I think that uh, it's something that's been on our wish list for a long time. Um, I am not opposed to them. Uh, you know, many of the, uh, the other agencies I talk to, some of the deputies and officers now uh, won't even leave the agency to go on patrol if their body camera's not working. Uh, 
Um, so it, uh, it talks about, uh, you know, the accountability and transparency. Um, so again, uh, you know, we have some hurdles to uh, work around, but I think uh, the team that we're going to form uh, and working in conjunction with IT and making sure that we select the right vendor uh, is going to be important. And uh, we'll start moving forward with that. So it's, yeah. a, it's a long time coming, but uh, I'm uh, excited about this. When we now we're getting into spring and summer, we have our monthly chat with Ottawa County Sheriff Sergeant John Knott. He's the new head of the Ottawa County Sheriff's Department's Marine Division. And uh, this ties in, probably he's involved with this as well. The State Marine Academy is being hosted this week by the Ottawa County Sheriff's Department. Yes, Gary. Uh, probably about uh, 10, almost 11 years ago now, we were approached by the Michigan Sheriff's Association, the Department of Natural Resources, and asked if we would host uh, a statewide Marine Academy uh, to train Marine deputies that are going to be out working the waterways in the state of Michigan in the summer. And uh, we took that task on and, uh, you know, we were recognized for uh, the quality and the uh, uh, operation of our Marine Division uh, to host this. And we've continued to host it. So right now uh, we are uh, training uh, a large, not a very large group, uh, but a group of people from across the state some are full-time officers, some are uh, seasonal officers that come in to work Marine divisions during you know, that 90 to 100 day period in the summer. And uh, it's a week long of uh, law training, uh, how to recognize an intoxicated voter, um, you know, first aid right on down the line and uh, even uh, boat operation and handling. Uh, yesterday, people that live along Lake Makatao may have seen a large presence of uh, law enforcement vessels out on the water. And that, that was all training exercises that were taking place to show them how to uh, maneuver, how to properly tie up alongside of a boat, uh, water rescue, uh, the whole gamut. So uh, I was down there uh, this morning and uh, you know just wanted to thank the group that was there and uh, just uh, overwhelming uh, response of the, uh, the information and the success uh, of a great week that they've had in, in training. I'm going to throw you a curveball question at the end of our conversation today, Steve, and I know that you'll do well, hopefully. Uh, Republican State Representative Pamela Hornberger from suburban Detroit has introduced a legislation that would establish a limit of five nanograms of marijuana per milliliter of blood as a limit for how much marijuana can be in a driver's bloodstream before they are considered intoxicated. We've talked about the marijuana situation when the uh, state relaxed its marijuana guidelines in the, a couple of years ago with the uh, voter initiative. Your thoughts about trying to set some side of limit. Can it be done and can it be done effectively to uh, make sure that we have safe driving on our roads? Well, Gary, and this was a little topic of conversation. I, I had the opportunity to, uh, there's a, a training in Bay City that's taking place right now of all the new newly elected sheriffs. And uh, I was there yesterday doing some instruction for them. And uh, this topic uh, came up when, obviously when they heard that this was introduced. Uh, you know, I'm kind of in between Gary, I, I wanna see more information. I wanna see more of the uh, data. Uh, the other part is, is I'm really curious as to how we're gonna do that roadside testing or the testing to determine uh, is it going to be, you know, like the breathalyzer gives you an instant result? Um, so again, uh, that's a process that uh, I want to watch very closely and see uh, the scientific end of it. Um, also to hear from, you know, prosecutors around the state what they think. So uh, one thing that we have found, Gary, since uh, the legalization of marijuana, we have seen an increase uh, in operating under the influence of uh, drugs. Uh, we are now training and have a, a small crew uh, from our agency and a couple other agencies in our county that are drug recognition experts that are specially trained uh, to recognize and do the roadside testing in that. Uh, they have uh, increased. Uh, matter of fact, they're out just about uh, once or twice a week sometimes because uh, we've seen that increase uh, in the driving. So this is going to be a very interesting topic to follow, uh, something that uh, obviously I'll stay on top of and watch. Uh, but again, I, I want to see the backside, the nitty gritty of it, and the uh, scientific information uh, that's there is, you know, is this a proper quantitative limit to set? Obviously, uh, you know, since I'm sworn in to uphold the, the Constitution of both the United States and the state of Michigan, which a lot of people forget that I have to uphold the 
Constitution of the state of Michigan also, which are our laws, uh, you know, what is put into place, we will have to work with. You know, and we've done that effectively with some of the other law changes, you know, when the marijuana did come into play. Uh, you know, we, you have to make policy and procedure changes, training changes, uh, and we've been very successful in that. So, again, uh, yeah, the verdict's not in yet. Uh, again, I'm a guy that wants a lot of information. Uh, and we'll see where we're going to go from here on. Ottawa County Sheriff Steve Kempker, as always, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much for answering our questions and chatting Thank with us, very. and look forward to chatting with you again next month. You bet. Take care, Gary and Peg. Thank you very much. Ottawa County Sheriff Steve Kempker on 99.7 and 1450 WHTC.